is uh, one of the most driven and social PhD researchers I've ever met. Uh, he has a distinct knowledge about Dutch heritage. I'm not counting the boys we went to, but uh, um, he's not only a friendly face, but he's also a valuable conversation partner when it comes to uh, his studies on uh, mental health benefits in games. Uh, and he's bringing us today to a really unlikely space if we talk about mental health and health. So we're, what, we're going to look at a horror game, right? That's right, we are. It's kind of exciting. <laughs> yes, Adam. Thank you very much, Mena. I just need another moment here. Can I ask one of you ladies in the back to shut one of those two lights off? Why, ladies? Uh, <laughs> can you put that one back on? <laughs> there you go, that's the one. I just need another moment here, please. <laughs> Can everyone hear me if I speak like this, or should I use the microphone? I don't think the microphone works. <laughs> microphone? Okay. So I think it's going to get... And how's this? Yes? Okay. A little bit more, or it's fine? Well, here we are, my clicker. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's actually really nice to be following up from Saunders' talk because I'm going to be talking about this game called Nevermind. It's a biofeedback game, um, and my talk is really going to dovetail from what he had to say because A, it uses biofeedback, similar to the facial expression uh, that we were seeing a moment before. And this game and this talk is especially about creating a personalized experience. And so what I want to do now is I want to walk you through the game Nevermind. And after I've walked you through it, um, I want to talk about some of the design decisions that make this a personalized experience and that give it tremendous promise as a game for promoting uh, mental health. So biofeedback game. Now, just a quick disclaimer. I am not a designer, right? I'm a PhD. Uh, I'm a psychology researcher. Uh, I did not design or develop. Never mind. I just worked very intimately with it, and I was very fortunate to do so with the help of their designers uh, in out in Los Angeles. Um, so that aside, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes telling you the story of just one of Nevermind's levels. And uh, I want to apologize in advance because I don't think that I will be able to field questions within uh, this space. So after the talk, I'm happy to meet with you. But I, I don't think I'll have time over for, to field questions here. So the next 10 minutes, we're going to walk through one of Nevermind's levels. Um, now, Nevermind casts the player as a neuroprober, a therapist of the future. Uh, and as a neuroprober, it's your job to enter the minds of clients who suffer from severe, life-hindering psychological distress. Now, the challenge is that your clients can't remember the root cause of their anxiety. They have a traumatic memory locked up somewhere in their subconscious, and it's your job to unravel that memory. And this is what brings us to the biofeedback mechanic in the game, which in the case of Nevermind, it relies on player's heart rate. So biofeedback just to be very clear, it refers to a system whereby the player's physiology provides input into the game world, um, and then the game world then reacts to that input, providing some sort of feedback to the player to which that they can uh, react to. Um, so in the case of Nevermind, your client's subconscious is not happy that you, another person, is lurking about digging around for clues to find this memory. So the more stress that the player is feeling, and the higher their heart rate becomes while they play, uh, the more hostile the game world becomes to this player. And I'll offer some concrete examples shortly. But first, uh, a quick spoiler alert. Um, I'm going to dive into one of Nevermind's levels, and I'm going to completely walk through it, and I'm going to completely ruin the mystery. So if you want to keep that mystery, you know, sanctified, then now is your moment for a quick lunch break. Um, and, and the same also goes for the fact that uh, this case that I'm going to talk about really, uh, I'm, I'm not joking here, uh, this case really does deal with some mature themes like alcoholism, firearms, domestic unrest, suicide, car crashes. So if any of these things are disturbing for anyone, then, you know, it's totally fine. No judgment. Take a quick early break. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it, it, I, I don't want to make light of this. Okay, so let's, uh, so let's enter the mind of client number 251. Uh, the game opens with a monologue from a young, middle-aged woman. She was the perfect little girl, she says. She remembers a happy childhood, playing jigsaw puzzles with her father. Her father passed away when she was young, she says. She can't remember it well, but her mother says there was a car accident. 
the client's mother also passed away recently, and that's when some problems have started to emerge. She often becomes paranoid around people. It seems like people are looking at her, judging her. This makes her feel guilty and angry, she says. But everything used to be so normal, she remembers with a sigh. And with that, we've entered the mind of client number 251, and we find ourselves in a bright, if somewhat warped, garden. A child's teddy bear and tea set lies innocently beside the tree. And this is where we collect our first of ten photographs. Now, in, never mind, each photograph represents a memory, and it will be our job to solve puzzles in order to unlock all the memories, all ten of these photographs. And once all of these have been unlocked, we must place the memories in the correct order. And this way we will unlock this traumatic memory that is the root cause of this patient's anxiety. So as we pick up our photograph, we hear a door creak open and we proceed forward. The house is a bit bare and a bit dark, but otherwise nothing seems out of the ordinary, at least until the player goes upstairs. And with that, the player is now engulfed in a nightmare. The world has fundamentally changed. Light has become darkness. Bloodstains appear on the floor and on the walls. If we uh, investigate the rest of the house, we see how unsettling the world has become. Uh, the player is literally in a broken home. And if we uh, investigate the kitchen, a spilled milk carton appears to have spilled blood. And the living room, which was once bright, is now shrouded in darkness and filled with ominous faces. Even the paintings on the walls have changed, so faces are now blotched out. And strange messages appear scrawled on them. So this is the point where I want to now talk about the biofeedback in the game, because it is in this nightmarish environment that the player now has to continuously master their anxiety level in order to solve the game's puzzles. And in each room that they explore, the more stress the player experiences, the more difficult it becomes for them to progress through the game. So let's go back to the kitchen for an example. Uh, if the player enters the kitchen, like this player does, and they're feeling a little bit stressed, what they experience is uh, the, the kitchen becomes flooded with milk. And the higher their stress levels, the higher this milk is going to rise. Until, in fact, if their stress levels are high enough, uh, they'll begin to drown. And uh, at this moment, it's really on the player to uh, calm themselves down, make the, pro you know, practice proper breathing skills to make all the milk subside. So it's these types of puzzles that are recurring throughout the game that are forcing the player to regulate their physiological stress, regulate their anxiety at the level of their heart rate. Um, and so as the player then overcomes these challenges by remaining calm in the face of really creepy, creepy scenarios, uh, the player will collect more photographs which tell the story of Client 251. Uh, so for instance, as part of the story, that her mother was a heavy drinker uh, and that her father may have been facing a debt crisis. Daddy and his letters, the photo reads. He never wanted to play after the mailman brought new ones. And the player is also reminded that Client 251's father was said to die in a car accident. He died in a car accident, Mommy said. She hated questions about it. And it would seem that Client 251's childhood was not as perfect as she seems to recall. It was pretty lonely, this photograph states. And we also learn the possible source for the spilled milk carton. Where did this imagery come from? And some of the later photographs become more gruesome. Uh, and the final photograph is highly suggestive. Uh, this one says, what is daddy eating? But eventually, the player will have collected all ten photographs, and he or she must return to the open garden to decipher what really happened to client number 251. The player looks up to the ten photographs they've collected and must choose five photographs and put them in the correct order to tell client 251's true story. And as the player pieces it all together, the game final uh, triggers a final cutscene. I 
I remember now. I was playing tea party out in my yard one day and I got thirsty so I went inside to pour myself a glass of milk. It slipped from my hands and spilled everywhere. I went to tell my mom but she was taking a shower. So I went to tell my father. He was upstairs in his bedroom and when I opened the door he had a gun in his mouth. He looked at me and and then he shot himself. He shot himself. It was so terrible. I, I couldn't remember what happened. So my mom, she must have made up the story of the car accident to protect me from ever remembering. But I guess I always knew that was a lie. I always knew. So that's one of Nevermind's levels. That's client number 251. And uh, if you're all still with me, what I'd like to now do is I'd like to walk back a little bit through the game and pinpoint these three design characteristics that maximize player involvement. So, first design characteristic, thematic congruence. Thematic congruence means that there's an overlap between the themes of the game and the player's visual experience. So themes like social anxiety, domestic unrest, guilt, and you know, separating fact from fiction, that these all become reflected by the game's art, the game's colors, and are also reflected in the objects that are appearing in the game. So let's give some concrete example. The idea that Client 251's family unit became corroded is depicted by a literally broken home. Um, also, Client number 251 spoke about this intense guilt she feels when she's being looked at by other people, right? This anxiety that she has when other people are staring at her, making her feel guilty and angry. Um, and this is reflected, um, uh, you know, in the fact that the portraits, and even in the non-nightmare version, in this on the right side of the screen, are blot, are are you know you can't see the faces. But then uh, in the nightmare version of the game, these faces are being blotched out aggressively. Um, and not only do these images recur throughout the game, for instance here and here, blank faces staring at the player. But in certain portions, faces will actually follow your player, really really staring at them in judgment, like in this screenshot. Or here as well. Creepy, huh? Yeah. Um, as a final example for this thematic congruence idea, at the heart of it, right, client number 251 feels personally responsible for her father's suicide. That's sort of the revelation that we get at the end of the, of the level. Um, and so the crux of the trauma is that she associates this spilling with the milk with her father's death. Uh, and what do we see when we encounter spilled milk? Well, spilled blood. Right, so these are, these are all themes that are being woven into the game. And this brings us to our second design characteristic, uh, environmental storytelling. Because when your game has such consistent thematic congruence, as a designer, you can convey your story via the game world itself. So if all the art in the game has a purpose that matches the themes in your game, then exploring the world comes to have meaning for the player. The more they explore, the more they are rewarded with details that help tell the story. And because this exploration is voluntary, right, you need to solve puzzles, but not all of the exploration is needed to solve these puzzles. So because it's voluntary to dig deeper within the game, the things that the player discover, they feel really special. This is something that Sandra was talking about. This is something that you were talking about as well. Uh, they experience a sense of ownership, like, oh, wow, I found this. I found the spilled blood. I found the face that looks at me, right? And these sorts of details are sometimes called Easter eggs. Um, and these are like special treats, which the designer tucks away for the player to find. Um, and Nevermind has these in spades, so I'm going to give some examples. Um, so from the onset, for example, uh, there are signs in the environment that client number 251's family was facing a debt problem. Did you notice the mailbox upon entering? And did you notice what was scrawled on this painting? You spilled? Um, and here it is again in the bedroom. Easy to miss, but if you discover it, it you know, it feels really special. Um, and here's one that's a bit more subtle. Uh, this, is a this is a jigsaw puzzle before the player turns the lights off, Family Games Incorporated. And now in the Nightmare version, here it is again, Fractured Family Incorporated. Telling the story through just, you know, the, through the environment. 
Uh, now, this last one is actually really messed up, I think. Um, so for players who dare to investigate this spilled over milk carton, and uh, you, I turn the audio off of the clip, when you're in this room, these flies, they make a terrible, you know, creepy buzzing sound. This is not like a pleasant place to be hanging out in the game. But, so for, but for the players who do indeed dare to investigate uh, this spilled over milk carton, uh, they get treated to these super dark messages. So on the front of the carton, it says, Happy Home Milk. This is obvious sarcasm. Uh, but on the other side, in, in an extreme attention to detail, we look at the uh, we look at the nutrition facts, and they've been replaced with, yes, total fault. They know your fault. Why did you spill me? Look at what you have done. This is your fault, right? So this is all telling the story through the environment. Um, now I could go on and on with more examples, uh, but let me just drive my point home here, right? These instances of environmental storytelling not only compel players to explore. But with each discovery, the player feels more and more like they are cultivating their own personalized experience, that they themselves are uncovering this mystery. Uh, and that's what brings us to the third design characteristic, uh, the biofeedback. So uh, I, I would call the biofeedback mechanic in this game very symbiotic. Um, so while environmental storytelling is one great way of making each player feel like their experience in Nevermind is unique to themselves, um, what makes Nevermind feel especially personalized, in my opinion, is its use of the biofeedback. So in the first place, uh, the biofeedback mechanic in Nevermind is consistent with the game's aims and designs. This is a really important point, uh, because it's very easy for biofeedback games to really get this wrong. Uh, you could imagine, for example, a game where an increased heart rate would make your player faster and move more around the world, right? The more active I feel in, when I'm sitting behind my computer, the more active my character is in the game. But, but of course, this would run contra to the core design idea of Nevermind, right? So instead, in Nevermind, the elevated heart rate indicates and stimulates within the environment adversity. Uh, and this forces the player to recognize their change in physiology, so they're being given visual feedback about what is about the fact that their physiology has changed. Um, and then they need to resolve this change in physiology in a, in a healthy manner. Um, so in this sense, Nevermind's biofeedback mechanic is really deeply embedded in the design. It's not just something that happens to be there. Um, now, another way it makes biofeedback makes this a very personalized experience is that different players, of course, will experience different levels of stress in different places, right? So for some, play for some players, the atmosphere in the kitchen might be particularly unnerving, but for other players, it might be in a car maze, an, uh, an area that I didn't show you in this presentation, right? And so for each of these areas, stress, first of all, has a unique effect, and this leads to unique experiences for different players, depending on their sensitivity. Uh, and finally... Uh, biofeedback in Nevermind lets players also kind of self-monitor. Uh, so if we think of Nevermind as a game which affords players this potential place to see what, uh, uh, what it's like when they experience anxiety and to then try to overcome it in this uh, safe environment, we can also think about the ways in which repeated plays of Nevermind for a single person might come to mark change in them. So they might be able to notice, well... I used to be really afraid. It used to take me three minutes to calm myself down in this room, and now it only takes me one or two minutes. Um, so the hope is that the more people play this game, uh, the more adept they become at uh, being able to resolve anxiety and lower their physiological level of stress. Um, and so it's on this that I want to just close my talk by talking about the science now of why Nevermind is such a promising tool for helping people. Uh, and this is where it's going to coincide a bit with my own res research. Um, so what, what Nevermind gets at with this biofeedback mechanic uh, is something called uh, interoceptive awareness. Uh, and interoceptive awareness refers to this ability to consciously perceive one's physiological states. So are my muscles calm or are they relaxed? Is that pain coming from here or is it coming from here? How is my breathing? All these sort of conscious levels of awareness of the, your, your physiological state, where your body is at. Um, and we know from psychology that there's really good reason to expect that the more skilled somebody is in recognizing their physiological states, that this becomes actually a very valuable skill for dealing with their emotions when dealing with stress. So um, uh, our emotions, you know, seem to be intrinsically linked to our physiological states because physiological states can trigger emotional states and vice versa. We saw this in Saunders' talk, I think, very, uh, uh, a really great demonstration with the, with the facial recognition stuff. 
Um, and so for this reason, emotion theorists have argued that the better internal, you know, the more internal awareness I have, this will equip somebody with healthy emotion regulation skills. And there are indeed a number of recent studies that uh, support these notions. So um, this skill, interoceptive awareness, has been negatively associated with alexthemia. Alexthemia is the ability to recognize and vocalize what our emotional experiences are. So people that are higher in interoceptive awareness are less likely to have these sorts of problems. Um, and we also know that people with greater interoceptive awareness experience, um, they experience less negative affect when being socially excluded. That's actually this third one. Uh, the one that I just skipped was that, um, people are with better interoceptive awareness are better able to bring themselves down from experiencing, uh, negative stress. Um, so taken all together, uh, interoceptive awareness, or again, this ability to recognize our changes in our own physiology, this can be an important skill for managing stress and anxiety. And this gives great promise to never mind as a potential tool for training people how to better manage their stress. So last fall, I was in Los Angeles, and I conducted a study with Nevermind. I, I'll finish on time, I promise, Marno. Uh, last fall, I conducted a study uh, uh, on, on this game, on Nevermind. And uh, the idea of the study was really simple. We simply asked people to answer questions about how they deal with uh, stress and uh, negative emotional experiences in their everyday life. And then we had them come in and play this level of Nevermind. And we simply wanted to look at to see whether we could see an association between what's happening with them on a physiological level and what they say they're, uh, you know, how well equipped they say they are when they're dealing with stress in their everyday life. And so to kind of showcase what the sorts of hypotheses that we're working on now with this data, I'm going to show you just a, a few of our participants, um, their heart rate data. So this is heart rate data from one session. Um, this is on the x axis is x on the x axis is time. On the y axis is their heart rate in beats per minute. Importantly, in the game, never mind uses heart rate variability, but for the sake of demonstration purposes, it just makes sense to stick here. And um, what you'll notice, per perhaps, with this participant is before they turn the light off, everything to the left of this line, we can see that there's sort of like a general average change in heart rate beats per minute from before and after. And we can also look at this person and see these very drastic but quick spikes in heart rate. And if we compare that to this participant, we see that there's a very different pattern of experiences here. So here the drastic quick spikes are not happening so frequently. And we also see that this person was able to lower their heart rate for a, sustained, uh, for a sustained period at some point during their play session. So the questions that emerge are, well, what is different about these two people, for example, that made this physiological experience uh, different for them? And I want to close my, with my last example, showing a participant who actually had to leave the session early. 25 minutes in, this participant with a base heart rate of about 80 beats per minute was experiencing spikes, you know, upwards of 110 beats per minute. She has one huge one after turning the lights off, a second one, a third one. She's working on her fourth one when she just turned to me from across the table and said, I have to stop. And I said, of course. So to close... Uh, Nevermind shows promise as a tool for training emotion regulation skills, in my opinion, uh, because it is designed to cultivate a personalized experience for its users. Uh, and how does it do that? It does that through thematic congruence and with environmental storytelling. Uh, and finally, by having a biofeedback mechanic that not only works technically, but which is also relevant and logical for its aims. Thank you very much for your attention, um, and I want to also just quickly thank the people that made this presentation possible. So Nevermind is created by a small studio in Los Angeles called Flying Mollusk. This is Aaron Reynolds, the uh, lead designer, and this is uh, Michael Anetta, the uh, creative producer of the game. Um, Nevermind is available. You can buy it. You can play it. Um, Nevermind was also started out as a master's uh, thesis at the University of Southern California. Mariantina Gossa supervised my project with it, and she also supervised it when it was a master's thesis. So much thanks to Mariantina for her supervision, together with uh, Dennis Rickson, who helped me when I was in Los Angeles as well. Uh, and finally, uh, my supervisors at the Ladbad University at the Behavioral Science Institute, Wilcher Engels and uh, Isabella Granik. Uh, if you have any questions about the game, I direct you to the team. They're more than happy to answer them. If you have questions about my research, then please find me. Thank you very much. Have a great day.